Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, thanks also, uh, Manuel, for um, organizing uh, this whole thing and for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and well, I should add that the following is uh, very much uh, a work in progress, which was in large parts uh, inspired by uh, Teresa's paper about uh, meaning perversion versus amelioration. And this is actually the first occasion on which I present uh, this talk. So uh, I hope it's not too confused and uh, look forward to your thoughts about it. So my talk is titled Changing Language for the Worse? Question mark, and um, it's motivated by the question of whether there are any potential pitfalls of linguistic activism in the social and political realm. And if so, what these pitfalls might look like. So what prompted this question, among other things, um, were a couple of critical articles that voiced worries about alleged net negative effects of um, meaning expansions and so-called meaning distortions. Um, for instance, in a 2016 paper, um, Haslam diagnoses a consistent trend in, to expand the meanings of negative psychological concepts, that is, concepts uh, which are employed to make sense of undesirable, harmful, or pathological aspects of human experience and behavior, such as abuse, trauma, addiction, or prejudice. According to Haslam, this so-called concept creep um, runs the risk of pathologizing everyday experience and encouraging a sense of virtuous but impotent victimhood. In um, an influential German newspaper, um, Bittner and Scheller worry that the concept of privilege as it is used by contemporary activists, think of uh, white privilege, for example, um, that this concept is socially divisive and ultimately detrimental to the aims of those advancing, uh, advocating for, uh, for social justice. And there are um, a couple of related worries um, about the inflation of concepts such as health or human right or the rule of law. Um, and about um, the more recent or uh, structural and systemic senses of racism and sexism or about the expansion of the meaning of the term hate speech. So at any rate, the actual or imagined dangers associated with linguistic activism or attempts to change the meanings of particular terms are a recurring top, a topic of public debate. And I think that for me, at least, these articles raise the question of uh, whether and under which circumstances linguistic activism might be morally problematic or impermissible. Um, Teresa Marquez, in a um, recent contribution to the volume Shifting Concepts, formulates an answer to this question of permissibility. So according to her, um, an attempt to revise uh, the meaning of the word is morally permissible if and only if the proposed revision does not amount to a meaning perversion. Meaning perversions, according to um, um, Marquez, come in two kinds, causal and constitutive, and I'm going to focus on the second constitutive kind here. So, an attempt to revise the meaning of a word amounts to a constitutive meaning perversion if and only if it involves a misapplication of a dual character term to an unsuitable referent R, which nevertheless conveys that R realizes the abstract norms or values that a proper referent of the term is presupposed to realize. So in short, a constitutive meaning perversion is a misapplication of a word to something unfitting the abstract values or norms presupposed by use and thereby eroding these values or norms. Um, that a revision uh, is a meaning perversion in the constitutive sense um, does not mean that it doesn't also have um, harmful uh, consequences or harmful perlocutionary effects. So here are two of Marquez's examples of meaning perversions. Um, the one is the word fanatic and its relatives, and the other, the word hero and its relatives, um, both as used in Nazi Germany. 
According to um, Victor Klemperer, the Nazis perverted the meaning of fanatic by turning it from a pejorative into a laudative term. And um, he claims a different kind of meaning perversion for the term hero, which rather than denoting someone who, who, whose deeds um, benefit mankind, was restricted to people exhibiting military bravery and foolhardy, death-defying behavior. So the Nazis tied the term to decoration and vaingloriousness, and they didn't recognize any kind of decent or humble heroism. Um, Marquez ties her account of constitutive meaning perversions to so-called dual character concepts. And so here comes a brief or maybe not so brief digression about uh, this class of concepts. Um, I'm, I'm sure that most of you um, know about um, dual character concepts, but I'll still say a few words about them. So um, according to Noe et al, um, dual character concepts are represented by a, both a set of concrete features and some underlying abstract values, where these representations, um, A and B, or these dimensions are linked um, or related um, in the sense that the concrete features are thought to realize the abstract values. Nevertheless, um, the dimensions A and B are distinct and can sometimes yield opposing verdicts as to the category membership of some object. So how do we know whether a concept has a dual character? Well, in their seminal paper, Nob et al. proposed two tests. First, dual character concepts such as artist or scientist support two kinds of normative statements. Um, generally speaking, test subjects um, judge the statements of the kind that's a good F and that's a true F, felicitous for dual character terms, but they judged um, the second kind of statement that is a true F weird sounding for non-dual character terms such as bus driver or optician. And second, dual character concepts um, admit of statements like the following. There's a sense in which this is clearly an F, but ultimately, if you think about what it really means to be an F, you'd have to say that there is a sense in which this is not an F. Besides science or scientists and art or artists, um, concepts uh, that pass these two tests are concepts like poem or poetry, love, teacher, or criminal. So I've got another example for a, what I take to be a dual character concept, the concept of a journalist. Um, so on the one hand, we can characterize journalists by a number of concrete activities or tasks um, they perform, some kind of job description, like the one oh, I copied here from uh, the website targetjobs.uk. On the other hand, we can characterize um, or the journalistic enterprise uh, seems to be associated with certain virtues or norms. And um, these here are taken from the website of the Ethical Journalism Network. So these are the two dimensions, the job description and um, what I call here the ethics um, of journalism. Um, and we may even want to say that journalism or good or true journalism helps to realize some even more abstract ideal like the ideal of the formation of political will in a deliberative democracy or something like that. Um, the two dimensions here can come apart. Um, so some individuals may satisfy the job description, but fall short of the um, more abstract virtues or values or norms I subsumed under the label ethics. Now here's how I understand which kinds of scenarios motivate Marquez's notion of constitutive meaning perversions. Consider a not too far-fetched scenario in which Donald Trump repeatedly praises Rush Limbaugh, the host, um, uh, as well as the hosts of Fox and Friends and um, the Breitbart contributors as true journalists, while consistently accusing CNN and the New York Times of fabricating fake news and spreading misinformation. Now, what Trump conveys by calling these individuals true journalists is that they're um, 
yeah, in their mundane tasks of researching, writing, and editing news stories, they exercise the journalistic virtues. They adhere to the ethical norms of journalism and realize its more abstract value, such as providing an essential component of deliberative democracy. Now, the worry seems to be, so the, the worry that motivates um, um, Marquez's account seems to be that um, by applying the term true journalist to individuals that clearly do not adhere to the ethical norms and values of journalism, Trump undermines or contributes to the erosion of these very norms and values. And since the latter is undesirable or bad, Trump's use of the term true journalist is morally impermissible. It's a meaning perversion. So much for um, dual character concepts and their role in, or what I take to be <laughs> their role in Marquez's notion of constitutive meaning perversions. Now, one worry I have about um, the notion of a constitutive meaning perversion is that if we rely on it, we might classify perfectly legitimate uses of dual character terms such as art or science as meaning perversions and hence as impermissible. Um, my conjecture is that many of the concepts that score high on the various tests for dual character concepts also satisfy Galley's conditions for essentially contested concepts. What are essentially contested concepts? Well, Galley characterizes them as concepts, the proper use of which inevitably involves endless disputes about their proper uses on the part of their users. So there are a few examples of such concepts which Galley discusses in detail, namely art, um, democracy, social justice, and the concept of a Christian life or a life in the Christian tradition. The point I want to stress is that if a concept is essentially contested, then it is to be expected that there are uses of a respective concept word that strike one party as improper, whereas the other party views these uses as legitimate, uh, legitimate uses or as natural extensions or improvements on such legitimate uses. For instance, we can easily imagine one party accusing another of an improper use of the term science when referring to gender studies, or of an improper use of the term art when classifying Banksy's graffiti as works of art. But still, I think that we should accept such uses as perfectly permissible or legitimate. Um, my assumption as to why dual character and essential contestedness often go together is that um, essential contestedness seems to be intimately tied to the second dimension of dual character contest, concepts. So the idea is that contestant parties um, disagree with respect to the questions of exactly which values, virtues, or norms are realized by category, uh, are realized by category members or should be realized by category members, um, and how these, sorry, I had to go back, and how these respective values, virtues, or norms are to be uh, weighed against each other. Um, what else does Galley say about <laughs> essentially contested concepts um, besides this very broad characterization I offered before? Well, he formulates five necessary conditions of essential contestedness. Later on, he adds two further conditions um, which help to distinguish essentially contested concepts from radically confused ones. Um, but here are the first five ones. So essentially contested concepts are appraisive, that is they accredit a valued achievement. Um, in the case of art, the achievement could be something like having produced a work of great aesthetic value. This achievement is internally complex, so it has to do with the presence of a number of different features, and it's therefore variously describable. And it also admits of considerable modification in the light of changing circumstances. And 
last essentially contested concepts are used both aggressively and defensively, which means that um, ideally each party recognizes the fact that its own use of the concept is contested by those of other parties. And each party further recognizes that their own use has to be maintained against these other uses. Um, so the two further conditions that Gelly adds can be summed up as follows. All contestant uses the concept acknowledge the authority of an original exemplar whose achievements the rival conceptions seek to characterize and develop. These uh, further conditions are meant to provide some unity to the respective concept in order to distinguish it from a radically confused one. And they also, they are meant to justify the continued use of an essentially contested concept. Um, with respect to art uh, the, or the visual arts, um, the uncontested exemplar could be something like an artistic tradition, such as Renaissance art, um, or its paradigmat paradigmatic artworks, such as the Mona Lisa. Um, and this original exemplar is then accepted by all contestant parties. And yet we can easily imagine quite heated arguments uh, or disagreements over whether Jeff Koon's balloon dog or Banksy's uh, street art qualify as art or as real art. And according to Galley, we should welcome these disagreements. He writes, recognition of a given concept as essentially contested implies recognition of rival uses of it, such as oneself repudiates, as of permanent potential critical value to one's own use of the concept in question. Whereas to regard any rival use as anathema, perverse, bestial, or lunatic means in many cases to submit oneself to the chronic human peril of underestimating the value of one's opponent's positions. One very desirable consequence of the required recognition in any proper instance of essential contestedness might therefore be expected to be a marked raising of the level of quality of arguments in the disputes of the contestant parties. So we should welcome these disagreements because um, in the end they um, improve our uh, yeah, arguments or they, they help us understand the problem better and um, put forward better arguments. Um, how many time? Oh, okay, I still have a little time. So um, two further examples of essentially contested concepts, um, this time according to Jeremy Waldron, are um, democracy and uh, the rule of law. Now, with regard to democracy, Waldron stresses um, the fact that different parties do not just disagree about borderline cases, but also about which cases are paradigm cases of democracy in the first place. Um, so depending on what one thinks it is that matters for a democracy, the United States might or might not be a paradigm case. Um, so I just included this in order to um, clarify that the contestation is really contestation at the core and not only at the borderlines. Um, second, with respect to the concept of the rule of law, Waldron calls into question um, one of Galley's um, conditions, namely the condition of reference to an original exemplar. Um, Waldron thinks that sometimes what gives unity to a contested concept um, and justifies its continued use um, is not an original exemplar that's uh, accepted by, our, by all contestants, but um, just something like a generally acknowledged problem or question. So on this account, the rule of law would, um, would be an essentially contested concept, but it's not an achievement concept, rather it's a solution concept. So um, in order to wrap up, so here again is um, Marquez's definition of a constitutive meaning perversion. So, uh, meaning perversions are uh, misapplications of dual character terms to an unsuitable referent, which convey that this referent realizes the abstract norms or values that a proper referent of the term, of the term is presupposed to realize. I maintain that if a dual character term is essentially contested, then what might strike us uh, or what, must, what might strike one party 
as an improper use or a misapplication frequently isn't one. And I said that for, um, or this is because for essentially contested terms, there is no universally accepted set of norms or values that a proper referent of the term is presupposed to realize. Rather, it's um, these values that we negotiate when we um, use essentially contested terms. And now I'd like to offer um, an answer to the question of what it is that distinguishes some of the problematic cases um, that Marquez focuses on from um, unproblematic uses of essentially contested concepts. Um, so take again the concept of heroism, which um, uh, is prominent in, in Marquez's paper. So Klemperer complains that um, for 12 years, the concept and vocabulary of heroism are increasingly and ever more exclu exclusively restricted to military bravery and foolhardy, death-defying behavior. My criticism of the Nazi concept of heroism is that it is always shackled to decoration and vainglorious. Officially, Nazism didn't, re uh, didn't recognize any kind of decent, real heroism. He then goes on and considers whether um, the family of words associated with hero worship um, really belonged to the language of the Third Reich. And he said, in one respect, yes, it did. But he adds that um, in another respect, as a matter of fact, no, it didn't. Um, because all these distortions and superficialities um, had clung often enough to this sonorous family of words prior to the Third Reich. So what I take from this is that heroism um, is and has been um, a contested concept. And what is problematic about, um, or, or what is problematic is, is not one particular use or other, but rather the um, kind of omnipresence and uh, the claim of uh, the claim to exclusivity on the part of the Nazi interpretation of heroism. That's what really pro uh, what's really problematic. Um, the Nazi use of heroic and its relatives did not show any appreciation of the different criteria in the light of which the other parties claim to be applying the concept in question nor did it show any recognition that one's own use has to be maintained against other uses. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> the use was, was not a use um, that was prepared to be challenged or argued for, but it was merely imposed on society. And, um, and we talked about this this morning. So that's what I, uh, what I think really goes wrong in a couple of the, um, cases that um, Marquez is interested in in her paper. What's really wrong with um, these uh, uses of the terms fanatic and heroism, etc., is that um, they are not put forward as um, a contribution to an open debate uh, that is prepared to be challenged and argued for, but they are rather imposed on society. They are um, backed up by violence and intimidation, etc., um, and I think that's the problem. And and maybe that's um, maybe not in all the cases um, she focuses on, but at least in in these cases. Okay, so um, that's it. Uh, here are some references, and I think I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you.